I'm in the utility room here because uh, this is actually where I'm connected to the, um, the internet. So, uh, you know, this is where I'm at right now. I'm doing the best I can trading on my traveling trading station, which generally speaking is not a big deal. I'm happy to trade on it. And I do trade on it for, you know, I mean, whenever I travel and I like to travel a lot, that's the great thing about trading. But what I didn't expect coming in here on Monday morning was the panic. We've got panic in the market. What's happening? There's tons of selling. So the Japanese market was down, I think, 12 percent. S&P 500, right, which is 12 percent is huge. S&P 500 right now, you look at the chart on the daily and we've got a big sell off. So this sell off began on Thursday. Uh, we had the sell off on Thursday. It continued Friday. And today we dropped all the way down to about 510, uh, opening around the lows. And now, as you can see, uh, bouncing back up. So we're on a little bit of a bounce here, which is, um, I guess, good. And I am in the green today, but I want to talk a little bit about this panic that we're seeing in the market. So, you know, I guess to set the stage a little bit and to give you context, we've been in a market that's been really strong and it's been kind of remarkable because the Federal Reserve comes out and in the face of increasing inflation, which if we recall, they said was transitory. It wasn't going to last long. It was just related to the pandemic, uh, but it didn't go anywhere. Inflation stayed high, right? Now, inflation has been high around the world. It's not just been in the United States. In fact, many would argue the United States has managed it better than other places because our economy has been really strong. But nonetheless, what the Federal Reserve did was out of nowhere, you know, in, in response to high inflation, they jacked up interest rates to the highest levels in 20, 25 years. And they did it faster than it's ever been done before. And that is a real test on the financial system because there are so many companies, I mean, even the government, that are running based on borrowing money. So when the cost to borrow money is higher, all of a sudden profit margins shrink and things get scary. So 2023 was actually um, one of the highest years of companies filing bankruptcy that we've had in a long time. And it's not surprising because with these really high interest rates, a lot of small companies just couldn't keep afford, they couldn't afford to keep paying uh, just servicing the debt, let alone doing the things they needed to do to grow. So we have this extended period where the Federal Reserve jacks up interest rates. As we know, we went into a full bear market during 2022, which really technically was a recession based on two quarters of declining GDP. But the government decided to redefine what a recession is. So we didn't have to say we were in a recession, but, you know, we were. And we went into a full bear market. Then the market recovers. And this is kind of incredible. We have this massive recovery here where the market goes up. I mean, the S&P goes up not quite 100 percent, but it's up like 80 percent off the lows, which is really outrageous in spite of the interest rates being so high. And so now you have companies, these big tech companies, especially like NVIDIA, that have been leading the way and traders have been, you know, get cautiously getting back into the market. Now, the thing that's kind of surprising here is that when interest rates are high, you could take your money and put it into treasuries and get guaranteed fixed return on uh, uh, just because of the high interest rate. And you're not taking any risk, right? You're just putting your money into treasuries. And so to put your money into the stock market, you're not going to do it for 6%. It's not worth it when you can get treasuries that are you know close to that. You're not going to do it for 7%. You're only going to put your money in the market if you think that you have the potential to get 10% or 12% or, or maybe higher. But as we saw, there were some individual tech stocks that have been leading this rally and have been helping support the overall market. Well, you know, one of the problems here is that because the stock market has been so strong, a consumer sentiment has also been on the strong side and spending has been strong and the job market has stayed really strong. So this has been a challenge for the Federal Reserve because they had kept saying they they'll reduce interest rates this year. And they originally had planned that they would start reducing interest rates in, I think it was late spring or early summer. And then they kind of pushed it back and pushed it back because the market's been so strong. 
The problem is, if you reduce interest rates, what's that going to do? It's going to spur spending, right? Now, if the interest rates were back at two and a half, three percent, and I could buy, you know, a house like this with two, three percent interest, I would consider doing that, right? A lot of people would consider doing things when interest rates are low. You refinance, you move, you buy a bigger house, etc. But when interest rates are, you know, five percent, six percent, even higher on a a big mortgage, people are just going to wait. So as soon as they start reducing interest rates, people are going to start spending. But that can cause inflation to go up. And we know that we're in an economy where we don't have enough houses for all the people that want houses. From 2010 through 2020, we had a decade of low new construction because of the financial crisis and the housing market explosion, blow up, bubble, in uh, 2007, 2008. Right. So we then went into a decade where we had a deficit on new construction and now that's caught up to us. And so the result is you can only build so fast. The cost of materials and the cost of labor is higher than it's ever been. So new houses are coming out slowly. It's expensive. And, you know, the, the one of the ways to keep the inflation in the housing market lower is to keep the interest rates higher. So the Fed's been holding this high interest rate. And then all of a sudden, boom, we get this jobs number here. Um, on Friday, that the um, the job growth, the, we now have unemployment at, I think it was 4.3%. So now unemployment, um, it, it has crossed the 4.2% threshold that they said they wanted. So the Federal Reserve said they wanted to see inflation around between 2 and 3%, at, which it is, and they wanted to see uh, unemployment up around 4%. And I know a lot of people are like, so you're telling me, the Federal Reserve wants to people, see people get laid off. But, you know, that's unfortunately, you know, when it comes to the numbers, they need to see slightly higher unemployment in order to feel comfortable reducing the interest rates. So the bad news here is that the Federal Reserve had, was slow to react to what was transitory inflation during the pandemic. And so inflation got a lot hotter than it needed to be. They kept the stim economic stim ec the, the interest rates really low, which was stimulating the economy. So they, they were slow to react there. And now they're slow to take their foot off the gas, so to speak, or however you was to take their foot off the brake, I guess is what it is, with reducing interest rates. So now we're at a place where, okay, uh-oh, interest rates maybe were held a little too high for a little too long. And now the market is starting to hurt a little bit. So people are like getting a little nervous. Uh-oh, are we going to see a recession? I don't think that's going to happen because here's the thing. I know a lot of investors are panicking, right? A lot of people are selling. And what's interesting about that panic is that if we look at, let me just pull up this window here. So so check this out. So today the market, you know, the, the Japanese um, exchange is down like 12%. And you pull up down detector. And look at all the platforms that are offline right now. Vanguard, Fidelity, Charles Schwab, E-Trade, Robinhood, Interactive Brokers. There you go. Weeble. Holy smokes. So what's happening? People are trying to log in. They're trying to sell. People are it, it, Traders are emotional, right? Fear and greed. So when the market drops this much, people get fearful. Now, this is the time to be buying. That's what Warren Buffett says. When others are fearful, you should be buying. I see this as being support right off the 200 moving average. And even if we go lower, I'm still not worried about it. And this is the reason. Because now the Federal Reserve is in a position where if we go into a recessionary period, they can reduce interest rates. They can reduce interest rates, and that's going to stimulate the economy. Now, what was kind of crazy about... Uh, the recession that we had through 2022 was that usually when you have a recession, you reduce interest rates to encourage the economy to encourage spending, right? Look, like I said, you drop interest rates down, people are going to start buying money. People are going to start spending. Businesses are going to be comfortable taking loans. So they, that was the opposite, though, in 2022, because the market was dropping because interest rates were going up. So they didn't have a tool to help ease the market. The market was just going to drop and there was nothing that we could do about it. I mean, more or less, it was just what was going to happen. And so, you know, that's why people were just saying like this, you know, the Federal Reserve doesn't care about the market. But now we're in a position where if we see more panic selling, the Federal Reserve has tools 
right now at their disposal that they can use. They could do an, an, an emergency rate cut. They could do that as, as soon as they want. They could do an emergency rate cut, drop the rates down, and then in September do another rate cut. And all of a sudden, we see a rate cut, and what's going to happen with the market? Boom, it's going to rally back up. That's my perspective. That's what I think. But I think what's also really fascinating here, and by the way, we're going to do a recap of my trades today. I'm in the green. I'm sitting here on my traveling trading station up 3600 bucks. Overall market's down. I navigated my way through the you know, landmines, found a little bit of profit, and I'm happy for that. So I'll go over those trades. Um, but, but first, just on sort of this topic of panic in the overall market. Something that does concern me is... And this is kind of the thing. Alan Greenspan, um, who was the chairman of the Federal Reserve, he believed in a um, in in self-correcting markets. That if you have bubbles, you have periods where um, uh, an asset class gets overinflated, the market will self-correct, and you don't need regulation to self-correct. In other words, he was more of a fan of being more hands-off and letting the market resolve these these bubbles just through natural supply and demand. Uh, and if you go back and you look at how the Federal Reserve and their monetary policy has affected not just the U.S. economy, but the global economy, it's really profound. If you So go back to the 19, late 1970s, 1980s, because that was the beginning of the deindustrialization of the American Rust Belt, right? So you look at these um, cities like Gary, Indiana, you look at Detroit. You look at these cities that at one time were thriving hubs of industry where things were made in America. And then what did the Federal Reserve do? Because of a change that they implemented, uh, all of a sudden, starting in that period in the 80s, manufacturing began moving overseas. It was cheaper. That was the first exodus, the first wave. And that, of course, continued. You, you go back to, and, and that was directly the result of monetary policy. You go back to the Great Depression. A lot of people talk about the Great Depression and have different schools of thought. There are two sort of economic schools of thought in the causes of the Great Depression. And I think it's always good to look back at history because history does repeat itself. But if you look at the Federal Reserve's monetary policy during the 1920s, money was cheap. It was incredibly cheap. And the market, as, as we know, got absolutely overinflated and it got overinflated partly because of the use of leverage people were buying on leverage so the market was getting propped up and then what the federal reserve did was when and this is so interesting when the stock market crashed we had the big stock market crash just prior to that they had begun to increase interest rates because they wanted to cool off the economy they, they wanted to, to sort of tamper down this bubble of the market but then what happened was after the crash in the 1930s, the early 1930s, we had this period where all of a sudden so much wealth vanished. And now governments, uh, state governments, but also the federal government, were struggling to balance the budget. So because they didn't want to operate at a deficit to balance the budget in a recessionary period, what did they do? They increased taxes. And that was a huge mistake. And that's so it was monetary policy that made the depression so deep and so lasting. What we now know is that during these recessionary periods, you wanna free up the flow of money so people can borrow, so people can spend. And so we've, we've learned from these mistakes, but it, I find it interesting that a lot of these big, um, these big economic events are the result of economic policy kind of trial and error. So I don't know. I mean, I, I just think it's really interesting. And so what we've got right now, you know, is a market that has been heavily influenced by monetary policy once again, right? Every time we hear, like back a couple, a few months ago, when we were starting to see inflation going down, every time inflation would drop, we would see a good number, the market pops back up. Every time we see, previously, when we were seeing the unemployment number going up, the market would go up. Why? Because once unemployment reaches a certain number, interest rates will go down. But the problem here, what's different about Friday, is that the unemployment or, or the, the unemployment rate went a little bit higher than was expected. And now it's like, uh-oh, did the Federal Reserve screw up again? Because it wouldn't be the first time. So did they screw up again? And now, you know, we're all sort of on the ride. 
And unfortunately, investors are very fickle. Very quickly, people shift from, you know, greed and euphoria and excitement that markets at all time highs is going higher and higher to panic, sell it all, cash out, put all my money in gold. So, you know, I, I think it's important to be able to have perspective. And the more you zoom out, certainly on the S&P 500, the more perspective you get. We, this is, the S&P 500 can be very volatile. This is not something that most people could tolerate being, you know, 100% invested in because we, we have historically had significant drawdown, big recovery, big drawdown. And so it's, it's volatile. It, most people would diversify so they're not fully invested in the S&P uh, just because, it's hard to stomach uh, a 50% potential drawdown before the next recovery. But if your time horizon is long enough, and for most people that are younger, it, it will be, even if you had invested you know, $1,000 in the market in 1929, at the top of the market just before the crash, you know, by 1970, 1980, 1990, it, it's like if you have a long enough time horizon, don't try to time the market and don't try to overtrade it. Don't try to get in and get out and, you know, sell before the drop and then get back in. You're just, it, that's not, all studies have shown that you will far underperform the market if you try to do that. So the real thing is, uh, are people over leveraged? Because if you're over leveraging your account through long-term investments, you're going to be anxious. So we always have to ask ourselves, can we handle the drawdown? If you can truly handle the drawdown, then you don't panic when it comes because you can handle it. That's the question a, a good financial advisor should be asking as you're setting up a 401k or how to manage it, or you're setting up your Roth IRA, or you're thinking about you know retirement investments. And I'll tell you that I am conservative. I'm conservative in my long-term investing strategy. And the reason is because I, I feel like for me, even though I know I have the benefit of time on my side, it's hard for me to stomach big drawdowns, especially when, you know, I've turned a tiny account into, well, $583 account into a $6.5 million Roth IRA. I put that whole Roth IRA into the S&P 500 and it drops 50%. I'm down 3 million bucks. That to me, even if you could say, look, Ross, well, over the course of 30 years, you know, it'll probably turn into 20 million or 30 million. I, I, what I would rather do personally is I, I'm more of, um, you know, bird in the hand, a bird in the hand is better than two in the bush, right? So I would rather put my money in more concrete asset classes that have, you know, fixed or pretty certain rates of return, whether it's real estate and you've got rental income or it's fixed income with, you know, financial instruments, which is fine and use smaller amounts of money that are going to be in a more speculative bucket. And then, of course, just keep day trading every day. Because if I'm able to day trade and I'm able to make $3,000 a day, you know, $3,000 a day times 250 trading days, we're talking about $700,000 a year. $700,000 a year. Now, most, most people use the rule of 4% when they're talking about living off of a retirement account or like a, you know, a trust or something like that. So if you've got $10 million, the rule of 4% will give you $400,000 a year, 400 grand a year to spend, and your account can keep growing pretty much in, in perpetuity. So for me, if I'm able to make $3,000 a day, 700,000 a year, that is almost the equivalent of having like a 13, 14 million dollar IRA. Now, the big difference is that a 13, 14 million dollar IRA, you're collecting the money without doing a, a thing, right? It's just passive income. Obviously, for trading, you've got to work hard for it, and you've got to manage your risk, and you've got to be here every single day trading the markets as they go up and as they go down. Okay, so now let's talk about how I managed to find profit during a day when the market is having um, probably, you know, one of the biggest uh, three-day red streaks in, I don't know, a couple of years. Okay, so first of all, I, I, you may have watched my weekly game plan from yesterday. The weekly game plan ended up not being um, super actionable because I only had one stock on it that I was sort of interested in. And for the most part, I knew I was just going to have to keep an eye on the overall market. And secondly, when I sat down and looked at the, well, so overnight, I saw the headlines that Japanese market was down quite a lot. 
And then I saw that the S&P futures were down quite a lot. So when I sat down at about 6.30 and pulled up my scanners, the first thing I noticed was that our leading gappers actually looked a lot like this right now. The leaders were only up like 30%. So I was like, all right, this is not great. We've got very minimal gappers here. Um, and this is, this is going to be a slow day. So I came on over and I sat down and at 7 a.m. Uh, I had MGOL up. MGOL is right now at 39% and it was um, the stock that I made uh, $208 on. So coming into 7 a.m., I'll pull up my 10 second chart. I had looked at this stock on Friday because it began its move Friday after hours. And so I think we actually talked about this one on um, in the weekly game plan. It was like, maybe it'll continue, but I was a little unsure about the catalyst. So anyways, pre-market it dips, and then it rallies back up. And then right in this area here, this is where I ended up taking my first trade. So right at 7 a.m., notice the spike of volume. You can see 7 a.m. just looking at the volume. It's right here. So, um, well, actually, I guess that's 7.15, but here's the volume. Sorry. So it comes right in here right about 7 a.m. Okay, so it starts to squeeze up, it pulls back, and it comes up right here. And I took my first trade on that micro pullback right there. And on my first trade, 5,000 shares, I bought and sold for a $477 loss. So I was like, okay, well, all right, I read on my first trade. So it pulls back, it comes back up, it pulls back, and I got back in right here, and it comes back up to about 65. It pulls back, and then it comes up here to about 70, and right about 74. So I ended up making back the money I lost, and I was up like $14 on the stock. Nothing meaningful, but, you know, whatever. It pulls back again, and it comes back up, and I got back in here. It pops up. It doesn't hold. It drops down. I made like 100 bucks on that. And I got one more trade on it right in this same kind of area. I can't remember if it was here or here. But another attempt at the breakthrough, $3.80. I was looking for a flat top breakout. And I ended up making a total of $208 on MGOL. The reason this stock was worth considering was because at the time it was the leading percentage gainer. The price was between 2 and 20, had volume, had a good float, nice low float, super high relative volume. The catalyst was a little questionable, and the fact that it was only up 38% was questionable, but it was uh, also moving. So that was my first, my first couple trades, and I was a little disappointed that I didn't make much headway there. If we look at the one minute chart, it might be easier to sort of see this pattern. So coming at 7 a.m., we pop up, we pull back, we pop up, we pull back, right? So we push a little higher. So a couple trades right in there, then we sell off, then we rally back up, a couple trades up in this area. And I was looking for the break through this flat top and I was looking for a move up to four. We didn't get it pre-market. At the open, we did get it, but I said I was gonna be hands off at the open because there was nothing that was really obvious enough. And MGOL, I mean, I was only up $200 on it. So I was like, I just don't feel like I've made enough to really risk it. Uh, some people have been asking about my trading pre-market versus regular trading hours. And something that um, I'll, I'll talk about more in an upcoming episode is sort of this, when I started trading more pre-market. So uh, in any case, at this point, if I don't have at least a decent profit cushion from pre-market, that's going to make me a little concerned because usually on a good day, I've got some nice trades from pre-market. So on a bad day, I'm red pre-market and on you know a really slow day, I've got no trades pre-market. So today I have a little bit of profit on MGOL pre-market, but really not enough to be meaningful. Okay, so that was MGOL. Then my next trade was SNTI. SNTI hits the scans and this one's kind of crazy. So <laughs> this stock hits the scanners and I see it has news. I see it's a biosciences company. So I'm like, okay, you know, we're in the right sector here. This is this is worth paying attention to. I pull up this chart uh, right here. And let's see. So it squeezes right here um, from 230. And I got in it at uh, 235. It goes all the way up to 295. I didn't take any profit off the table. I was like, okay, hold on a second. If this thing is going to keep going, I'm going to be adding... Three dollars, three fifty, four. Like who knows? And then it just dropped right back down. So I ended up being up fifty cents a share more, but losing three hundred sixty bucks on it. All right. So I should have taken the money off the table, taken the base hit. But what you know, in fairness though, when something goes up a fifty cents or a dollar a share, 
that is something usually to pay close attention to. So, so anyway, so after that, I'm down 140 on the day, and I'm just kind of sitting here, and I'm like, I don't know. And I saw T E N K hit the scanner um, a little bit earlier in the morning, and I was like, noticed it. I saw it was a recent SPAC. It looked like a recent special acquisition company. And I was sort of like, yeah, I don't know. That's interesting. Um, you know, sometimes those make big moves, but, you know, we'll just have to see. The price is uh, a little higher for me, and I, I don't know. So I was kind of like, I'm not sure. That was when it was at about uh, right in this area. So this is when it first uh, came up on the gap scanner here, showing like 19 on the ask, but then bid of 15. So a little bit of a spread. And then someone in the chat room says, wow, T-E-N-K. And I'm like, I, I look over at the scanner and I see that it's showing $22 a share. So I'm like, wait a second. All right. So this thing just went from, you know, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. So I pull up the chart. And by the time I pull up the chart, I'm seeing 2240 on the ask. And then I'm seeing 25 and then I'm seeing 27. And I was like, all right, holy smokes. This thing is squeezing. What I know about this stock type is that recent special acquisition companies, like recent IPOs, like recent reverse splits, have the potential to make really big moves. A recent special acquisition company is not going to have a long history of selling off. It's not going to have a ton of bag holders. It usually doesn't have a lot of institutional traders that have already taken a stake. So the degree of high frequency trading algorithms will be minimal. So these are stocks that are often thinly traded, and we have seen them in the past make explosive moves. So right here, it's already up $10 a share. So I see that, and I'm like, okay, you know what? Um, I, I'm going to take a starter. So I buy 250 shares at 27 bucks. I'm like, you know what? I'll just take a starter. And I add at 27, 14, and I add at 29, 15. And then I add, um, and I got a partial fill at 28.35. So I got a couple partial fills. Then it comes up to $30 a share right here. And I add right on that little red candle, I add right here for the break of 30. And all of a sudden we're seeing 34, 35, 40 on the ask. I saw $48 on the ask. And I'm in at like $28 a share. So that's 20 points between the bid and the offer. And I was like, wow, okay. Let's see what this wants to do, because it wouldn't be the first time we've seen either a recent special acquisition company or we, and we've seen this in some of the Chinese um, stocks as well, where they'll go from 20 to 40 to 60 to 80 to 100, and they'll do it on super light volume. And it's really hard to trade these if you don't have experience trading them, because the chart pattern, what I was trading wasn't really the chart pattern. What I was trading was the tape. I was trading the level two, what I saw right here the level two in the tape, just knowing that the stock at that moment was our leading percentage gainer and seeing how fast it was moving up, I bought at whole dollars. So I added at 27, then I added at 28, I added at 29, I added at 30. Okay, so then all of a sudden it's showing $48 on the ask. I put an offer on the ask at $40 to sell half. I didn't get filled. I, I, I mean, I was like, what the heck, I'll try. I put another order at $48 on the ask. I didn't get filled, right? You never know. It's always worth a try, but I didn't get filled. So then I sell half at about 36.10, and I sold more another quarter at 34.74, and then it dips down. I buy the dip at 19, right around 19. I buy the dip down here, and it bounces back up. So I bought the dip right there, and it bounces back up here to about 24. So about a five-point dip. And then uh, it's, it was sideways for a little while, and I sold it. Um, and then I was waiting to see if it would curl back up, but it, it came back down. So in total, I ended up making almost $10 a share on what was a starter of 250 shares, but I added with 25 share blocks up to about something like 450 or just under 500 shares. And that was really kind of a surprise. I was not expecting it. Um, and one of the things I said was that with these types of stocks, again, I'm going to trade the front side of the move, and you just don't know how high they'll go. Some of these, um, you know, some of these will just keep going, right? They, the sellers won't come in. Shorts are too nervous to short something like this. There aren't sellers, and it just keeps going higher and higher. 
So because I've seen that before, I usually like to try to give it a chance to see if it's going to open up. But really, it's the first move on these that's the best. And then if it pulls back, but it holds about 75% of the move, then I'll look for the next leg up. But because this pulled back this much, I was like, I don't think it's going to work for anything more here than just a bounce off the low. And that ended up being the case. Um, who knows? By the end of the day, though, you know, it starts to curl up and gets a little more volume. This could go back to 20 or 25 fairly quickly. I'm trying to think. Um, there's a couple stocks. Uh, I'm trying to think of um, if anyone uh, listening in here can remember a, a SPAC that made a big move. I'm trying to remember one. I'm thinking right now, most likely, I'm, the ones I'm thinking of are these um, some of these Chinese IPOs that went just insane. But, but they're similar in the sense that you have a stock that just doesn't have sellers. So this was HKD. And HKD on this day here, uh, and like let's be real, this, this day had 2.5 million shares of volume. It's not a lot of volume, but it went from $20 a share to $72. Holy smokes. That, I mean, that is a, that's a really big move. Um, so let's see. Um, and then up here, look at this. So look at this day up here. On this day right here, it went from $600 a share to $2,600 a share on how much volume was that? That was on 400,000 shares. So that kind of rate of change with that light volume is insane. And usually, to be honest, usually, when they're up at this price range, I'm not able to participate very well because it's just too expensive. Uh, but nonetheless, I try to trade them when they're in the slightly cheaper range and when the spreads are a little bit tighter. Um, LPA, yeah, we can look at this chart. So yeah, this was a recent, the, actually, I can't remember if this was a SPAC. Um, I can't remember, but that that's another, I mean, just... This, so on this day, this went from $25 to $275 on um, 200,000 shares of volume. So you can't take big size with these because there's just not enough volume. You get a lot of slippage. But with small size, there are times where I've traded these types of stocks and I've gotten 10 points, 15 points, 20 points. You know, And, and that's where I end up being like, even with 100 shares, I'm up a couple thousand bucks, which is incredible. RGS. So this is going to be a, a case study for sure of one of those stocks that um, light volume, recent um, special acquisition merger that makes a huge move. And it just, you know, I just happen to kind of be um, in the right spot to get a trade on it today. It just, at that time, it was the leading gainer. I had the confidence to take a small position, relatively speaking. The share size wasn't too big and got a nice move. It's a bummer it didn't hold up, but... You know, it's it's just the way it goes with these. So I, I'm trading them. I'm an active trader. Nothing I'm buying, I'm like, I'm going to hold this until, you know, whatever. Um, oh, there's TEN case, speak of the devil. So coming back up here a little bit, right? So now it's hitting the high day scanner because it's going green on the day, right? So it just made um, that red to green move, technically. It's still below VWAP, but anyway, so... That was kind of a wild card surprise. That gave me my biggest green trade. And, you know, that at that point, I had that. And I had the other trades, which weren't very meaningful. So I was sort of like, all right, I don't want to overstay my welcome. I want to take it slow. I want to manage my risk. And, um, you know, this is going to be the type of market where we really want to try to focus on what's obvious. But if we look back at the S&P 500 right now, look at the daily chart. Right? Look at that big green candle right there so when others are fearful that's the time to be a buyer let's go back here there's i have another one back here um this was the one back here this was a panic day right there we were already selling off then pre-market we're gapping way lower and then boom the whole day it just squeezes higher so yeah i mean i don't know what the mark where the market's going to be at the end of the day but so far this is a nice rally off the low and it's it's good to see all right, so TENK now at 1840, so you know, kind of rallying up a little bit. Not sure if you'll get. Um, oh, it's actually halted up right now, showing $19.74 resumption. So, yeah, it's just kind of that time of day. I think where, it, if it was going to die more, I guess it could have, but, um, but it is tricky when you've got that big upper candle wick. 
And MGOL, for what it's worth, was also giving us some big upper candle wicks uh, today. And, and those are hard. You know, it, it just shows the stock pops and then reverses quickly. So, you know, I, I don't like when, when I see those big upper candle wicks. All right, so let's see. Um, now, one other thing that I'll mention, by the way, is um, right now we've got our Dog Days of Summer sale going on here at Warrior Trading. So for those of you guys who are members, we have, uh, you go to your dashboard, you can check your renewals page for links to renew your membership, whether it's renewing for, you know, a year or adding time to your membership, you can do renewals. And for those of you guys who are going to listen on YouTube, come on over to the website, warriortrading.com. You can click the join now button that'll bring you to the membership page and then you'll see our dog days of summer sales the, the specials right now so you get some extra discounts some extra savings and one of the things i'm a big advocate of is that learning to trade is a marathon it's not a sprint it's about making small incremental progress so if you could commit i just want you to imagine if you could commit an hour a day to learning about the market for the next year where do you think you'd be now, you could commit an hour a day to learning Italian for the next year if you want to learn Italian. You know, you want to do something like that. And I'm sure you would be much better at speaking Italian than you are today. So if your goal is to learn more about the market, to gain financial literacy, to be more confident, certainly during these moments of panic, to have a better outlook, if you want to be able to manage your own account and start actively trading it, the best time to start was five years ago. The next best time is now. So start today, start making that incremental progress. All right, so check out the specials we've got on the Warrior Starter, on the Warrior Pro membership. That'll give you access to my curriculum. And I'm looking forward to seeing you guys uh, who have been tuning in on YouTube in the chat room, hopefully uh, bright and early tomorrow morning. I will be here as always, sitting down, trading, and hoping to find some momentum. But as always, I'm gonna be cautious. I'm gonna manage my risk. I'm not gonna overstay my welcome. So I'm happy you know, to sit on the sidelines and wait and be patient until something sets up and looks good. All right, so thank you guys as always for tuning in. I'll remind you that trading is risky. My results aren't typical, so manage your risk, take it slow, and always, as always, practice in a simulator before you put real money on the line. I'll see you guys for the next episode real soon. Warrior Pro members, I'll see you back here tomorrow morning.